that does not get addressed at all in the president's brief at all. It is the, I think a key point is the dereliction of duty. So it is very challenging to establish incitement as a matter of law without having right. the risk of the, right. the backlash, right? It, this backfires if we suddenly criminalize speech. So the key difference here are two things. One, this is not a criminal trial, right? This is a civil proceeding under impeachment. But I think it's also a different burden of proof. Um, it's not beyond a reasonable doubt. I think that the key question is, what did President Trump do after a riot was breaking out? And this is where I think the House brief yeah. is strongest, is that it lays out that dereliction of duty and the president's team, President Trump's team offers no response to those facts. It's such a good point, and one of the most, Jill, one of the the the, the, the worst um, parts of his actions on that day are the, the the reporting we have and some of the facts presented in the impeachment manager's brief. That while it's happening on TV and we're all watching it, everyone's freaking out. And people are calling the White House. He's doing nothing. He's not taking steps. He is derelict in his duty. And they also make this point about the sort of First Amendment protections. The Supreme Court has made clear the First Amendment does not shield public officials who occupy sensitive policymaking positions from adverse actions when their speech undermines important government interests. And in this case, that seems clearly applicable. It definitely does. This is a case where the proximate cause of what happened was his remarks on the mall and his instructions to march to the Capitol but it's preceded by a meeting on January 5th that we need more evidence about, but which seems very, very damning to him, and by funding of the rally organizers that we also need more information about, and by months of lies about fraud in the election. Both before the election happened, he said it's going to be rigged, and then afterwards he said it was stolen from me. So he set the stage for what could only be determined to be violence to take back the government that he said had been stolen from his control. And that makes him guilty. And no matter what your definition of First Amendment rights are, it doesn't include an ability to say, go and attack the Capitol, fight like hell. They do address that one fact, but they claim that he was saying you have to fight for election security. Yes. That is such a stretch that it is ridiculous. Jim Neal from the Watergate case, he was the senior lawyer on the trial, used to say it's like trying to stuff 50 pounds of garbage into a five pound bag. And that's what this is. There is no excuse for this. The, the, the point, the sort of constitutional question is very clear to me that Republicans would like to just wriggle out of this on process grounds, if at all possible. They don't want to deal with it. They can't even tell you what happened on January 6th. That's over. It was whatever happened. So, Jed, this, the, the, the point about the former officials, I thought this citation was interesting, and I've seen a bunch of people say this, that when the, the founders were drafting this, um, that, that in England, where there was an impeachment process, the parliament impeached only two men during the 18th century, both former officers, that it was just clearly understood at the time that impeachment extended to former officers, and of course it's happened here in the U.S. as well. So let me say two things about this. First is that, that this is a very important point that in, in the Federalist Papers, Hamilton says we are drawing from this impeachment practice from England. And again, only two impeachments in the 18th century. One was a former official for bribery in 1725. The other happened during the summer of 1787 while they, and they refer to it. Um, and that was Warren Hastings, the governor of India. And that's part of the background. And I, I the House... Uh, brief cites a piece I wrote called an originalist case for impeaching ex-presidents, citing the debates from July and from this very same time. I am concerned, though, that there are, it's not just process. There is a stretch of the word incitement that I hope the trial will be more precise and careful about. Yeah, it's, uh, incitement uh, is, is a hard one in any court. Um, and in some ways here, it's only part of a larger seditious conspiracy. But that is the charge as presented. Jill Wine-Banks, who co-hosts the podcast Sisters in Law, and Jed Sugarman, thank you both. I want to bring in one of the impeachment jurors who also witnessed the events. Donald Trump is being impeached over Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of uh, Rhode Island. Let me start with this. How much mental space is this trial occupying a U.S. Senate that is as busy as it has been in a very long time? Um... I don't think a great deal. 
Um, once the presentations are made, they will obviously have our full attention, and they should. But um, I think that some of us feel going into this a little bit like we did going into the previous impeachment, that a lot of the Republicans have already made up their mind, that they made a political decision about how this is going to turn out, and that the evidence and the presentation by the House managers is not going to change their point of view. So we'll have to see. I think there's curiosity about how this plays out, given that this was personal for so uh, many of us and such a humiliation for our country to have its capital ransacked this way. But um, I think uh, the real effort will begin when the trial begins. In terms of the trial, I mean, uh, this was not, you know, we do not have a complete factual record. I mean, as I sit here talking to you, Senator, um, a Capitol Police officer, Officer Sicknick, who will lie in honor tonight in the Capitol, lost his life. And you and I both, unless I'm missing something, have no idea how he died, at whose hands, in what context, what, what happened, who the perpetrators might be, whether there's, uh, you know, a search for them, whether they've been identified on videotape. I mean, that's just one of the many, many factual holes in the question of what happened that day. And I wonder how much you want to learn about that, think the trial is a venue for that, or the commission that the speaker talked about today. Well, you know, it's the old map maker's dilemma of how much detail do you want to get into on each little segment of the coast. You can end up never finishing your map as you dive down into the detail. Here, the question is a very broad one. Did the president of the United States acquit his constitutional responsibilities when he sent a mob, an inflamed mob, up to the Capitol uh, for the purpose of their disrupting the orderly counting of the electoral votes, a direct assault led by the head of the executive branch against an ongoing operation within the legislative branch of government, and then, once he knew it was underway, failing to take any steps for a very long period of time to stop it, and indeed, according to testimony from the White House, information from the White House, I should say, actually delighting in the prospect that he'd created this tumult and this turmoil. So that's a pretty simple question. Was he acting the way a president of the United States should act, or was he violating the separation of powers, inciting a riot, and failing to discharge his duties to protect and defend the Constitution. You don't have to know who hit Officer Sicknick in the head with the fire extinguisher to know that Donald Trump failed at those duties. Yeah, that, that your your understanding of the constitutional responsibility here, it's, 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 it's a point well taken. My journalistic instinct, which is to know as much as we can about this, which is still striking to me that we don't, the point about responsibility yeah. you make, I just, I guess the final question here is, you, you said that most of your colleagues have probably made up their mind or made a political decision to have made up their mind. I do wonder how much the personal experience of it matters. We'll see. We'll see. I think that the House, if it's opening pleading is any indication, is going to put on a strong case. And it's going to bring back memories. And it's going to make people, I think, perhaps give a fresh thought to the politically comfortable position that they may be in. So I wouldn't rule it out at this point. Um, a lot of my colleagues are honorable people. I just think they're in a political pickle on this one. And by the way, the things that you point out, we should figure that out. We should know a lot about all of this through the FBI investigation. We should know a lot about the role of our colleagues through House and Senate investigations. So I'm with you on making sure that at the end of the day, we have a full understanding of the criminal activity that took place on January 6th. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Coming up, Dr. Anthony Fauci on the race to vaccinate the country and the ongoing risks from the virus as it mutates. Dr. Fauci joins me live next, don't go anywhere. At VisionWorks, we want you to feel safe. And we want you to see yourself in your new glasses and think, ooh. But if you get home and your ooh is more of a hmm, you have 100 days to change your mind. That's the VisionWorks difference. VisionWorks, see the difference. Incomparable design makes it beautiful. State-of-the-art technology makes it brilliant. The visionary Lexus NX. Lease the 2021 NX300 for $359 a month for 36 months. Experience amazing at your Lexus dealer. 
YouTube video has thousands of movies and shows that you'll love. It's all included with Prime. I literally Googled best online life insurance. Ladder life insurance popped up. Got an estimate and I was like, wait, what? It's like a third of my household's cell phone bill. Congratulations, you have life insurance. Get your peace of mind right there and then. Here's how Ladder works. Answer a few quick questions and get your personalized quote. If you're eligible, we'll cover you with the tap of a button. It's that easy. Come see for yourself why customers love Ladder. Million dollar policies available for just $27 a month. Check your price now at ladderlife.com. We're not saying Daily Harvest will change your life or that it will be the first of many steps to healthier habits. But we're not not saying that. We can say that Daily Harvest takes care of food so that food can take care of you. Get started today at dailyharvest.com. When you take a statin drug, it can also deplete your CoQ10 levels. I recommend Cunol CoQ10 to help restore this important heart health nutrient. Cunol is the brand I recommend considering along with your statin medication. of nuts.com it's the best kept secret of savvy snackers all over the country incredible nuts dried fruits organic snacks and gluten-free treats there's something for everyone to love including free shipping with your first order best pistachios ever love the dried peaches white chocolate toffee cashews are awesome the holy grail of honey sesame sticks the quality has made me a customer for life with so much to love and free shipping with your first order check out nuts.com what if you could cook amazing food with very little effort every night? Brava simplifies the art of cooking so that you can make time for the things that matter most. Visit brava.com for more information. I've always had a problem with sweaty hands. My feet were so sweaty. The general sports bra area. My upper lip and my forehead. It was just stressful. It's really been a tremendous struggle. We don't just sweat under the arms. So we created the Carpe line of sweat management products for all over the body. I haven't had sweaty hands in two years since I started using Carpe. Honestly, just completely changed my life. Avoid expensive treatments, injections, and prescriptions. Get Carpe today with limited time savings of up to 30% off at mycarpe.com. Medical school is very stressful. I lost a lot of hair during that time. Nutrafol is 100% drug free and it's natural. You can't argue with clinical proof. Start your hair growth journey at Nutrafol.com. We've seen some encouraging trends of late when it comes to the virus. COVID cases and hospitalizations have fallen uh, in most states. They're falling nationally in the past few days. So that's good. We appear to be on the other side of that latest third wave, which was by far the worst. Also, vaccine news continues to be a bright spot. Today, Russia's two-shot vaccine was shown to be highly effective in providing strong protection against COVID, according to peer-reviewed findings published in the Lancet Medical Journal. So there's another vaccine on the case globally, and the New York Times reports. Get this. Out of the roughly 75,000 people who've received one of the five vaccines in a research trial, not a single person has died from COVID, and only a few people appear to have been hospitalized. All undeniably good news. But I've reported on good news before here, and it's followed by bad news always. So we are very much not yet in the clear. Joining me now is Dr. Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Uh, great to have you back on, Dr. Fauci. Let's, let's talk about vaccine efficacy. Um, we've talked a lot about the national picture here, but Sputnik is a reminder uh, that the whole world's fighting this. Does it matter to Americans for, that other places get vaccinated and get, get vaccination programs up? Oh, absolutely. That's why it's really very good news about the success of the Russian trial, which showed more than a 90% efficacy. That's exactly what you want. You want to get the virus suppressed throughout the world, because when you're dealing with a pandemic, if there's a good degree of infection and spread in any part of the world, it's always a threat to where you are. So, I mean, if you really want to crush a pandemic, it's got to be a global effort. I mean, it's obviously very important to be successful. And as you showed the curve, Chris, 
of the infections going down. Hopefully, we'll continue that downward trend. And hopefully, as we get more and more people vaccinated, the level of infection in our own country will get lower and lower until it really is not a threat. But if we do that in a vacuum, without the rest of the world also suppressing the virus, it'll be a continual threat hanging over us. So it's very important that the rest of the world get vaccinated. That's why I was very pleased to see the result of the Russian study. Another vaccine that is being used internationally but not in the U.S. as of yet is the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. Uh, that was a joint project with Oxford. There were some problems with the, the trial, but ultimately it did get uh, approval in the U.K. It is actually being administered in the U.K. And I've seen some people you know, respectable folks, folks in the field, wondering if the U.S. is waiting too long on AstraZeneca, if the FDA schedule is too lax, if we should be pushing to get that out uh, into the hands of, uh, of Americans, even though, as you see there, uh, three countries are, are not recommending it for, for seniors. Well, that's right. You know, there is a little bit of a controversy about that. I think, for the most part, the news is reasonably good. But we have a trial going on right now in our own country that we would like to see the data of that phase three trial, which is a solid, well-organized trial, so that we can make the proper decision about the safety and the efficacy and what place it will have among other vaccines. I mean, the, the, the good news is, Chris, that in addition to Moderna and Pfizer, we have the J&J, &J, the Janssen one where the trial came out and showed a good degree of efficacy, particularly in advanced disease. We have Novavax, which is another vaccine platform, which is a soluble protein that we're looking upon favorably, and hopefully we'll get some good data there. So there are a lot of, the, there are a lot of vaccines in the mix here right now, and I believe the process that we're going through is the proper process to get the good scientific data to make good public health decisions. Um, I, it's possible that you have lost audio from me, uh, so I, I'm, just, I'm just saying that in case you're blinking at me uncomprehending. You, you have. Let's do this. Um, let's take a quick break. We will be back with Dr. Anthony Fauci. We have him back. Thank you, control room. Dr. Fauci, you got me there? I got you. I can okay. hear you now, Chris. Okay, good. Um, so so when you talk about the sort of, uh, the, the, we have a number of vaccines, right? So there's, there's a number that have, been, uh, have, have these emergency use authorizations. There's others coming up. So the way that I've been thinking about vaccines, and maybe we can just talk through this, right, is that to get a person vaccinated, it's like three cherries on a, on a, on a slot machine. You need to have the vaccine supply, right? Someone's got to make the thing. Then it's got to be delivered to someone who's got a syringe. And then there's got to be another person with an arm who wants it, right? So we, we got to get, we got to supply the vaccine. We got to deliver the vaccine. We need demand for the vaccine. What is the obstacle now? Right to American scale? What is the limiting condition on how many people we can vaccine right. right now of those three factors? Yeah, well, there is a very minor component of some parts of the country in which it is ineffic inefficient getting it into the arms and there's some vaccine on the shelf. But overwhelmingly, if you look at the entire country, the supply does not at this point meet the demand. Right. So if you get on the phone with mayors and governors, the biggest complaint is we need more vaccine. Get us more vaccine. There are a couple of locations where they're inefficient in getting it into people's arms. But I can tell you, Chris, I'm on the phone a lot. I just got off the phone literally a few minutes ago with a mayor of a big city, and that was exactly what the person was saying. Get us more vaccine. We need more vaccine. We will be doing better as we get into February and March and April. There will be an escalation of doses that are available, not only from the Moderna and from the Pfizer, but also from the other companies, the one I mentioned, the J&J &J and the Janssen and the Novavax. We will be getting more. But right now, we need to get more vaccine in the hands of the administrators who are going to be administering the vaccine. And if that's a supply issue, again, I, this is, I guess, a somewhat naive question, but I've seen people, there has been speculation and arguments about the degree to which, say, intellectual property can be opened up so that, say, other pharma companies 
could, say, produce more of the vaccine. Then there's others who argue, no, 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 you don't understand. The supply chain for mRNA vaccines is very difficult. You can't just make this up. Like, how should I think about how, the, how big can the supply get how quickly? Right. You know, if, if one had done this months ago to get what we call the Defense Production Act, to get other companies to be making a product that one company discovered. So if you could say, okay, what I want you to do is I want this company and this company that has these facilities to make vaccine to start gearing up to make, let's say, the mRNA vaccine. It would take a considerable amount of time to get them to be able to get the process right. in place to do it. It's not like making shoes or clothing. It's, it's a very difficult process. So if today, you know, in the very beginning of February, we said what we're going to do is we're going to use the Defense Production Act to get other companies to make whatever vaccine. Take, for an example, empirically, an mRNA vaccine. By the time you got that facility geared up to make it in a way that would be acceptable and approvable by the FDA with all of the inspections and things that they would do, by that time, we already would have enough vaccine to vaccinate most of the country. Right. So it's a reasonable idea, but for now, it's a little bit too late for that. So I've, we've watched this horrible third wave that we've had. It's been the deadliest. It's been the most brutal in this country. We've acclimated to 4,000 deaths a day. Um, I know multiple people through networks of people who've lost family members or have hospitalized family members. It's been a brutal winter. We're on the down part of that slope. The big question to me is, is that the, just the dynamics of the kind of thermostatic public response where we've seen this a few times or people start to get a little scared, they pull back, maybe they do a little more social distancing, antibodies build up in a community because it ravages through a place, people go indoors, and then people come back out. And I guess the big question is like, how confident are you that we're not gonna get a fourth wave? What has to happen for that to happen? Yeah. Right. Okay. What, you know, uh, Chris, you raise a very good point. Uh, when you have the surge, you have to figure out what triggered the surge. The big surge that we've been through right now that has been so devastating was a combination of a bunch of things. The cold weather, which forced people indoors. The post-holiday gatherings, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, we knew we were going to see that kind of surge. All of those things together, one maybe more than the other, but that led to that. You can't keep going up like that indefinitely. Right. That's the reason why you have the plateau. That could be due to a number of reasons. The susceptibles, the ones who are most susceptibles have already gotten infected. People get a bit frightened by it, yep. so they double down a bit on public health measures. I don't think enough people in any given location have been infected enough to say herd immunity has come in. I don't think we're there yet. So you're asking me a question. How confident am I that we're not going to have yet again another surge? I think if we double down uniformly and consistently with the public health measures at the same time as we phase in increasing numbers of people getting vaccinated, we shouldn't see that. One of the wild cards, Chris, that we have to keep an eye on are the mutations, yeah. the mutants that are out there. Because if they become dominant, that then could lead to another surge. But the best way to prevent them from becoming dominant is double down on public health measures, all the things I've spoken about with you, masking, distance, uh, avoiding congregate settings, etc. At the same time as with the supplies that we have, we vaccinate as many people as we possibly can. If we do that, and I underline the if, we should then continue to see the downwards trend. But we've got to keep our eye out on the mutants because if they become dominant, they could be a problem. Yeah, that is, the, that is a big fear also uh, for folks uh, coming up this weekend. I, like many Americans, like to congregate with others to watch the big football game. Uh, don't do that. Don't do that. Dr. Anthony Fauci, uh, thank you so much for making time tonight. I appreciate it. Good to be with you, Chris. Thank you for that. Again soon. Uh, still had the rogue agency ignoring the orders of the new president and following their own deportation policy. That's next. 
everyone is at risk for enamel loss. When you drink or eat something that's acidic, it sucks the minerals out of the tooth surface. Pronamel is formulated to help deliver minerals to the tooth surface to help reharden and strengthen your enamel. If you're like I was, you're tired of worn out plastic mats under your office chair. Vitraza glass chair mats are the premium alternative, made of super strong glass and protected with a nanotech coating. So you'll always get a smooth, easy glide. A Vitraza glass chair mat will completely transform your workspace, home office or office office. We stock 18 popular sizes and we ship free to anywhere in the lower 48. Get the look you deserve. I invite you to shop online at vitraza.com. Stay tuned to get a free five-piece utensil set and more from Gotham Steel. Tired of digging through a mess of pots and pans just to find the right one? Well, now there's Gotham Steel Stackmaster Cookware. Non-stick, space-saving cookware that neatly stacks inside itself. Finally, you can have an organized kitchen with every pan and lid right at your fingertips. Stackmaster features a triple-layer titanium coating with our non-stick, super-durable cast texture surface. Nothing sticks to these pans. Everything just slips and slides. It's like cooking on air. You can chop right inside them without making any scratches. Even use electric metal beaters and everything slides right out. Not even a scratch. Plus, they're oven safe. Great for pot roasts or baking all the way up to 500 degrees. Even flames won't damage these pans. The entire Stackmaster set is dishwasher safe and made without any harmful PFOAs. Some high-end cookware sells for close to $500, but you won't pay that. Not $400, $300, or even $200. Today, through this special TV offer, get the full 10-piece Stackmaster cookware set for the factory direct price of just five payments of $39.99. And we'll even ship it to you free. And if you call or click to order today, we're going to drop one payment. You'll get it all for just four payments of $39.99. And we'll even guarantee it for a full 10 years. Plus, as a free bonus, you'll get our Stackmaster Fry Basket and Stainless Steel Steamer Insert. But there's even more. We'll also send you our five-piece utensil set. It includes every utensil you'll ever need in the kitchen. Together, these are a $60 value. Yours 100% free. That's a complete 17-piece set, a huge value, for just four easy payments of $39.99. And we'll even ship it to you free. Call or click now. To order, call 1-800-836-4695 or go online to GothamStackmaster.com. So call 1-800-836-4695. That's 1-800-836-4695 or go to GothamStackmaster.com. What's my safe flight story? My truck is my livelihood. So when my windshield cracked, the experts at Safe Flight Auto Glass came right to me. With service I could trust. Right, girl? Safe like repair, safe like replace. What if you could cook amazing food with very little effort every night? Brava simplifies the art of cooking so that you can make time for the things that matter most. Visit brava.com for more information. Moon Pod, a breakthrough in relaxation that's quickly becoming the world's most popular beanbag. Our custom zero gravity bee technology acts as your personalized cushioning system. Moon Pod is the most comfortable place in the universe. Try yours today at moonpod.co. Best sleep of your life. Guaranteed. Over one million happy sleepers sleep on a Nectar mattress. Starting at just $4.99, Nectar Sleep gives you the best sleep at the best value. Plus an incredible risk-free 365-night in-home trial. Forever warranty for peace of mind and free shipping. Go to Nectarsleep.com right now and get $399 of premium accessories, sheets, mattress protector, and premium pillows, all included with every mattress. It's our biggest offer ever. This morning in the early hours, the United States deported a man named Paul Peerless to Haiti. Except here's the thing. Peerless is not a Haitian citizen, does not have a Haitian passport, and in fact had never been to Haiti before. Through an odd accident of birth, Peerless is stateless, essentially. He was born in a French territory to Haitian parents, but was not eligible for automatic citizenship from either country. He has instead lived in these, this country, the United States, since childhood, and he had a work permit. Now, the Trump administration tried to deport him before and was stopped at the last minute, just in January, after an intervention from the office of new Congressman Mondaire Jones and a group called Haitian Bridge Alliance. Now, the congressman's staff was told by Peerless that he expected to be transferred to a detention center in his home state of New York, but instead, something very different happened. According to Congressman Jones, at 3 a.m., 
My staff woke up to an urgent call. Suddenly, and in the dead of the night, ICE was set to deport Rockland County's beloved Paul Peerless to Haiti, a country where he has never been. And there was nothing we could do to stop it. Now, ICE did not return a request for comment by the time we were on air tonight. Peerless is now in Haiti for the first time in his life. This happened despite President Biden's deportation moratorium for most categories of immigrants. Now, even though a federal judge in Texas blocked that order, the thing about it is there's no legal requirement to start scheduling deportations again. But that didn't seem to matter to ICE. As Congressman Mondaire Jones noted today, quote, ICE is a rogue agency. With the help of right-wing operatives on the federal bench, ICE is choosing to ignore the president's deportation moratorium. And this is not a one-time thing. It didn't just happen once. MEC News reports that in recent days, ICE has deported immigrants to at least three countries, 15 people to Jamaica on Thursday, 269 people to Guatemala, and Honduras on Friday. Now, this kind of freelancing, one would think, would hopefully stop immediately now that Alejandro Mayorkas is the new Secretary of Homeland Security, sworn in just a few hours ago.